before we move to the uh, final uh, element on our program, um, I want, we want to pause uh, to uh, begin a new tradition at HDS. It's, um, as, as somebody is, who studies the history of religion, uh, you, you learn very fast that, um, uh, that, that traditions are things that have to start somewhere. Uh, and, uh, uh, and at Harvard, I find over the years, and particularly all the years I worked with undergraduates, that uh, traditions are anything that's at least three years old. Um, and uh, I discovered that particularly as a housemaster, where you have three-year populations. And uh, so it immediately becomes a tradition if it lasts three years. We're starting a new one at HDS that I hope is going to last a long time today. And uh, I'm glad to be able to share this with you. Uh, this tradition is namely the public recognition of an individual who has made an outstanding and long-term commitment to improving the life of Harvard Divinity School. The first recipient is someone who has meant a great deal to me personally, as well as to Harvard Divinity School institutionally. And to me, as I've made the transition to leadership of a Harvard faculty and school in which I had not previously served, it was tremendously valuable to have someone whom I had not known when we both happened to be studying at Harvard at the same time back in the late 60s, um, but who has helped me make that transition. I'm proud to count him today as a friend and as a trusted counselor, and thus it's especially gratifying for me to be able to recognize Jerry H. Baker of Atlanta, Georgia. Jerry graduated from Harvard Divinity School with a B.D. in 1971 and has led a distinguished career in the executive search industry, particularly focusing on, pub, on, uh, on, on the education sector uh, rather than the uh, for-profit sector. So uh, uh, nonprofits and uh, particularly universities. Uh, and he's become well known uh, for his work in placing particularly leaders in university positions uh, of responsibility. Uh, he's been an invaluable asset to HDS in a lot of ways, uh, serving on, and when I arrived, even chairing the Dean's Council, serving on the HDS Visiting Committee of the Board of Overseers, uh, as well as on the Divinity School's Alumni Council. He's also been a member of Harvard's University Committee on Student Excellence and Opportunity. More recently, the committee that is trying to develop and has been trying to develop uh, since uh, Lawrence Summers appointed the group uh, a, a comprehensive strategy uh, for doing throughout the university what the college has already been trying to do, and that is make this university in all of its schools and parts accessible to young men and women who have not the means and would not even think about uh, coming to this institution. And uh, I think that he may, that he, Jerry may himself be somebody who understands the importance of scholarships and support, certainly as I do, having had my education um, here uh, on someone else's tab, and I probably wouldn't have had it otherwise had that not been possible. So I'm particularly grateful for his work, both for HDS financial aid, but also for the wider university. Um, he's also served on the, the uh, university's uh, committee on university resources, uh, who are the people uh, who, in fact, most regularly and staunchly uh, support this university in all of its various parts. One of Jerry's most significant areas of focus here, however, has been on the financial aid itself. And I think it's particularly fitting to honor him tangibly and visibly uh, with this award that we not just give him a plaque, which I'm going to read to you in a moment, but that, that we do something a little bit more tangible than that more tangible for people who really need it. We're going to this year dedicate a special full tuition scholarship uh, and stipend in his name to be awarded next year to a promising uh, student at Harvard Divinity School. And I know that that will be something that he will feel is maybe the best thing we could do uh, uh, to honor him. Jerry, I'd like to ask you and your wife, Cassandra, who I know has worked with you and joined you, in supporting our work for a long time here to please come forward. Now I'm going to get formal and read the inscription on the calligraphed plaque here. 
Dean's Distinguished Service Award, Harvard Divinity School. Committed and energetic pastor, ordained in the United Church of Christ, you served congregations in New York and Miami after graduating from Harvard Divinity School and before pursuing a career in executive search services. The skills and compassion you brought to your pastorate transferred beautifully to your, your new career. With discernment and caring, you have counseled hundreds of professionals and helped institutions attract the best candidates. Your belief that there is good in all human beings has been a guiding principle that has assured your success. As a wise listener and advisor, you have mastered the art of gathering the ideas, ardor, and intelligence of others, weaving them into a fine tapestry for the benefit of all. You have given freely of your time and talent to Harvard Divinity School as a member and chair of the Dean's Council, a member and president of the Alumni Alumni Council, and as a member of the Visiting Committee. Your service, however, has not been limited to Divinity School as a member of Harvard's Committee on University Resources and the University Committee on Student Excellence and Opportunity. You represented the interests of the school and served as an advocate for the important role the school plays as a part of the larger university. A steadfast supporter of the annual fund, you have also established the Baker Martin Scholarship Fund, providing critical financial aid to students who otherwise might not have been able to pursue their studies at Harvard. In doing so, you have not only created an important legacy at the school, but have inspired others to make similar philanthropic investments in the future leaders and scholars of religious and theological studies. Proud husband, father, and grandfather now, with Cassandra at your side, you raised a family instilling in them the values you hold dear. For your abiding affection and strong commitment to the students, alumni, and faculty and staff of Harvard Divinity School, and with deep appreciation for the counsel you have provided to me and my predecessors, I am honored to present the first Dean's Distinguished Service Award to you, Jerry H. Baker, BD 71, on this 12th day of April, the year of our Lord, 2007. We've allowed a couple of hours for Jerry to respond. <laughs> we are deeply honored and very touched with this. Uh, this has been an absolute uh, joy and pleasure to devote time and energy over the years to, to this wonderful place. Uh, indeed, the co-recipient is my wife of 38 years. Allow me just a moment to let you understand how we have gotten to where we are. Let me sketch out loud the family tree from which we come. My father's father was murdered when my dad was 12, killed in the coal mines of West Virginia because he wanted to help the other coal miners. My mother's father died when she was two, died of appendicitis because they couldn't get him from that small farm to a hospital. Cassandra's father and his family, as Cassandra says, defined the term dirt poor. They made it on a farm. Cassandra's mother's family had a successful dairy farm until the Depression, and they lost everything. But they all said, we must go on. We must not stop. My father's family wanted his mother to put the children in an orphanage. She said, we will not. My mother and her mother and grandmother said, we will persevere. Cassandra's father's family made it enough on that farm to survive. Cassandra's mother family prospered. Perhaps they were all students of Churchill because they said, you must never, 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 ever give up. And we didn't. I arrived here in the fall of 1968. Remember what it was on any campus in the fall of 1968, but particularly this one. Everything I owned I had in two suitcases, and I might have had $50 to my name. 
I showed up and learned that a man named Harvey Cox was going to be my advisor. He had written something about a secular city somewhere. A man named Wright was going to teach me the Old Testament. My dean was a man who taught me the New Testament, Christer Stendhal. My life changed. That year was Cassandra's senior year at Wake Forest, our undergraduate alma mater. She graduated. Three weeks later, we were married. Everything we owned then, we put in the back of a trailer and drove from North Carolina here. We had a couple of pieces of furniture our family had given us. I think our net worth might have been $300. Mm. We had wedding presents that we had just gotten, and off we came to Cambridge. So we arrived with a table and a chair and $500 and eight sets of salt and pepper shakers (laughs) and a bunch of silver trivets. But what we arrived with was an absolute commitment to each other, an absolute understanding that we were here for the right reasons, that we would make this work with God's help, and we've never looked back. A few years ago, when our net worth was above $500, we said, now what do we do? And it was very easy. That house where Cassandra's mother grew up in is now a shelter where women who have been abused and their children live safely and comfortably. That family farm that has been around since 1850, we now own. She doesn't look like it, but she's now a cotton farmer. We may be the only ones here who understood the story of cottonseed this morning. My parents both died in the last couple of years that there is now a part of a pediatric hospital in my hometown named in their memory. But perhaps the greatest joy we have received is allowing other young men and women to experience what we experienced. It has been our utmost joy and pleasure to share what we have with those here at this place. Easter Sunday, a few days ago, we were at our little church in Highlands, North Carolina, where we have a home. And the minister said, sometimes the message of Easter is that it's just too good to be good, to be true. Can it really be? And sometimes I feel that my life has been too good to be true because we have been richly blessed. We have no choice but to share that. As it is written, to whom much is given, much is expected. Friends, we are the to whom. We are deeply honored. Thank you. I don't even want to try to follow that with any words. I'm going to turn the program over now to Bob. So. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Jerry, um, for those inspiring words. It, um, yeah, there's nothing much to be said other than it was an inspiration. And uh, for those of us who are um, charged with raising the resources and um, expanding the network, um, and uh, through our external relations effort, um, we're reminded how important and vital uh, donors and alumni and friends of the school are. So thank you so much for uh, all that you've done um, and that all that I'm sure you will continue to do in the years ahead. I, it's now my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, someone who's a familiar face to many of you, and that's the Houghton Research Professor of Theology and Contemporary Change and the Director of the Summer Leadership Institute, Preston Williams. Thank you, Bob. Kevin Johnson was what one might call in athletics a walk-on, a most unusual walk-on, because when he walked on, I found I had a franchise player. 
We did not recruit him. He found us. In 1989, while still a student at the University of California, Berkeley, and a star athlete in both basketball and baseball, he began a program of give back to the neighborhood in which he was reared. That program of give back has continued now for 18 years and is a unique model of community revitalization. The vision for the program and the hands on leadership it experience is that of Kevin Johnson. He was inspired and taught by his grandfather, George Pete, but he has made the teaching a reality. Kevin is a 12-year veteran of the National Basketball Association, having played most of those years with the Phoenix Suns. As in high school and college, he was a stellar performer, setting records as a point guard and scoring assists and steals. During those years, he also guided St. Hope Academy, a nonprofit after-school educational program located in the heart of Sacramento's Oak Park neighborhood. St. Hope Academy's initial purpose was to tutor young people and provide them with the opportunities for educational, social, and spiritual growth to assist them to one day become leaders in their communities. In 1991, Johnson spearheaded a, fear, a fundraising drive, which culminated in the design and construction of a 7,000-square-foot, $1 million facility, which has served hundreds of local students and their parents. In 2000, St. Hope Academy transformed itself into a full-fledged, nonprofit community development corporation designed to revitalize inner-city communities through public education, civic leadership, economic development, and arts enrichment. Through comprehensive art, volunteer and real estate development divisions, St. Hope Academy has achieved much success, including the rehabilitation of a 25,000 square foot mixed use facility, which now includes a 200 seat theater, bookstore, barbershop, Starbucks, art gallery, and loft apartments. It was in 2000 also that he attended the Summer Leadership Institute. He'll tell you about that experience. All I can say is that we did not hinder his success and that he has since then sent his pastor and several of his staff to SLI, and he has returned yearly to lecture and teach others. His program and staff at St. Hope are multiracial, multicultural, and religiously divorce, diverse. St. Hope's initial purpose in October 2001, Johnson formed a nonprofit corporation, St. Hope's Public Schools, to create and operate charter schools in Oak Park. In partnership with the Sacramento United School District, St. Hope Public Schools opened PS7, an elementary charter school that currently offers a rigorous curriculum for nearly 400 children in grades K through 8. In that year, also, he opened five autonomous small schools in the Sacramento High School, on the Sacramento High School campus. St. Hope Public Schools now provides an opportunity to learn to more than 1,300 students at Sacramento High School who are enrolled in either the School of Arts, School of Business and Communications, School of Law and Public Service, 
and School of, Maine Engin- Ma- Ma- School of Math, Engineering, and Health Sciences. In April 2006, Johnson was recruited by a community-based national campaign called Stand Up to be one of their national spokespersons. The campaign was initiated to address America's education crisis, and it received substantial funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. As part of the kickoff to the stand-up campaign, Johnson and Bill and Melinda Gates appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show on April 12, 2006, encouraging a national call to action for all parents, teachers, administrators, and students of Stand Up, and to demand excellent high schools that prepare students to succeed. In response to the airing of that show, Johnson was asked to come to Harlem in New York City by a group of parents who were unsatisfied with the operation of their charter school. Shortly thereafter, the New York City Department of Education entered into a historic partnership with St. Hope Academy to help revitalize the Choir Academy of Harlem, a struggling 500 student K through 12 public school. This marked the expansion of St. Hope Academy outside of Oak Park and paves the way for a new St. Hope operated charter school in Harlem by the year 2008 and 9. The Summer Leadership Institute and Harvard Divinity School are proud of their association with Kevin Johnson and pleased that he has come to speak to the Leadership Council. Kevin. Thank you very much for that introduction. I don't know if I have a whole lot to say <laughs> to explain everything that we do in those remarks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, Williams, very much. Uh, Dean, thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed last night's dinner. Um, that was an unbelievable exchange with John and uh, Secretary Albright, so I appreciated that very much as well. Um, I know a lot of you have travel plans and are trying to get out of here, so I'll cut my remarks maybe a little short. Uh, tell you a little bit about what we do and uh, talk a little bit about the Summer Leadership Institute, and then I believe at the end we're going to open it up for a few questions. I guess since we're in Boston, I might as well start on this note. Um, I played 12 years in the NBA for the Phoenix Suns, and if you follow basketball these days, uh, the Phoenix Suns are one of your top two or three teams in the NBA, so I'm very proud of that association. And on the other hand, those of you who are Boston Celtic fans, I'm going to give you a little nostalgia so you can feel a little bit better about these days. <laughs> uh, my rookie year in 1987, we were playing the uh, Boston Celtics um, in Boston at the old Madison Square Garden. And um, a game typically starts at 7.30. And each team member has to be at that game an hour and a half before the game. So if you have a 7.30 game, everybody rides around 6 o'clock. And the group that's hurt, like the ones who need extra treatment on their bodies, or the rookies have to take the earlier bus, and they have to get there even an hour earlier. So all the rookies and, and the, those that were a little bit, I don't want to say disabled, but had some mild injuries, they would arrive at 5 o'clock. And me being really excited to play in the Boston Garden, got there at 3.30. <laughs> so I took a cab over on my own, 3.30, had my bag, knocked on the door. And How many in here have been to the old Boston Garden? Okay. So I knocked on the door, and I was young. I mean, I looked a lot younger than I looked today. It was 20 years ago, and they wouldn't let me in. So that was a bad sign from the beginning. I was trying to explain to the guy, no, I really do play in the NBA. And they're like, I've never seen you before. And I said, no, I'm a rookie. And he's like, I don't believe you. And somebody finally recognized me, so they let me in. So now I'm in the lobby trying to get to the arena, and uh, there's a door that goes into the arena in the, square, in the Boston Square Garden. So I open the door, and I can hear this rhythmic sound going where it was going, I was like, what in the heck can that be? 
So I walk in there again about 340. It took me 10 minutes to get in. So 340 and Larry Bird was in there shooting. Now think about that. The guy was already a MVP in every degree, won championships. Veterans typically get there a half hour, hour and a half before a game, and he's there four hours before the game. So for those of you who are Boston fans, Larry Bird was the real deal, and I can attest to that. So that, that's your nostalgia for the day. Uh, the three things I want to talk about today uh, won't take me very long, but I do want to talk about Harvard Divinity School's uh, summer leadership program. In, 19, in 2000, um, I retired from the MBA the second time. The first time I retired was in 1998, and uh, I was out for a year and a half trying to figure out what to do next, and I figured I might as well go to Divinity School, get on the Lord's good side. And I applied and got into Harvard Divinity School, got my acceptance letter on March 21st in 2000. Very excited. Two days later, the point guard for the Phoenix Suns at the time, Jason Kidd, broke a bone in his foot. And the organization called me and asked, would I come back out of retirement and finish out the season and help the Phoenix Suns get to the playoffs? So now I had to negotiate with the Lord. Do I go to Divinity School or do I go back and play basketball? And I decided to go back and play basketball. Um, and the irony of that, I deferred my admissions to Harvard Divinity School at that particular point. But they had a summer leadership program during the summer that I went to, and it was a two-week-long program. And that changed the way we did economic development and community service and public education in my community. And I don't know if you guys have ever got a chance to experience it, but what Dr. Williams is doing at Harvard Divinity's summer leadership program was, was unbelievable. For someone like me, the, the first thing that was critical is it gives faith-based community organizations and practitioners exposure to the highest level of thinking. So you're in an environment with 40 or 50 other community developers around the country, and you're getting people coming in doing case studies, uh, the method from Kennedy School of Government to business school, education, economic. And normally nonprofits, we kind of run like social services. Not Harvard, of course, but normal nonprofits in, in, in communities run like social service organizations. And what they were teaching us is there's an element of sophistication that you must have when you run a business, no matter how big or small it is. And that was very, very helpful for us. And the other thing that I thought was equally as important is the program encourages and empowers pastors to look at their churches differently. And you can't just look at what you do within the walls of the church. You have to have your ministry expand beyond the walls of the church. And if you think about it, Jesus didn't spend a whole lot of time in the temple. He was outside beyond the walls of the church carrying out his ministry. So that was very, very influential. So if all of you would just for one moment give Dr. Williams a hand for me. So the St. Hope model, Dr. Williams explained a lot what it is. I'm going to try to do it really briefly. We're a community development corporation. We're faith-based. We have a multi-pronged approach to what we do. It's a holistic way of attacking the community in urban communities. So our four areas that we focus on are public education, economic development, civic leadership, and the arts. And the arts really ties to culture and expression which is really important. If you're going to revitalize a community, you need to preserve the things that are historically very powerful and meaningful um, to that community. Education is a cornerstone of what we do. Um, and I think churches and faith-based organizations need to play a much larger role in terms of public education around our country. And I think Dr. Williams' program allows us to do that. Um, what we've realized, if you want to truly transform a community, Education has to be at the center of those efforts, but education alone will not do it if you don't have economic development and community revitalization as part of the formula. And I know it sounds like a lot, but when you grow up in those communities, it's really, it's really not. If you don't have jobs and services and goods for people in that community, it's going to be very difficult to improve the community to the degree that you want. And that's kind of our approach and what we're doing. And Dr. Williams talked about it. We've been in one community for 18 years. 
And we have been asked to go to other cities around the country, and we said no, 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 no. And then finally, Harlem was an opportunity that we couldn't refuse. And now we're taking our program to Harlem and very excited about that. There's four students. Can you guys raise your hand? I guess you can all recognize them. They're in purple. And <laughs> and everything that we do has to be student-centered. So when anybody asks me to speak around the country, um, more important than an honorarium and even a scheduling is, can you pay for students to come? Because if you can pay for students to come and they can get a chance to be exposed and walk the campuses of Harvard and Cambridge and the cobblestone streets and then go back to their community and tell them what they saw, there's no more powerful influence than that. And they know that they have an obligation that whatever they get, kind of like Robin Hood, you kind of steal from somewhere and you take it back to your community for the, for the greater good. So they have an opportunity and obligation to give back to their community. And at the end of the program, when you guys ask me a few questions, um, they're very, very well versed. So if you have a question for them, don't, don't hesitate to call on them. We're trying to get, you, get them used to the college environment at an early age. So you always got to be ready to think on your feet. Um, again, our approach is holistic. And let me connect this to the church really quickly, that the achievement gap in this country is devastating, and we all know that. It's devastating. African Americans and Latino 12th graders are performing at the same level as their white peers in 7th grade around this country. So you have 12th graders that are Latino and African Americans performing at the same level academically as 7th and 8th graders for their white counterparts. That's not acceptable. And we need to figure out a way to combat this thing. And I think churches and practitioners can play a very critical role in doing this. Has anybody in here ever heard of a pit school? Not the University of Pittsburgh, but a pit school? A couple of you? Well, back in the days of slavery and coming right out of slavery, a, a, a pit school really came about because African Americans, black people, could not congregate together other than in a church. Church was the only place that African Americans could assemble together and be legalized. And what these folks did back in the day is realize how important education was even then, that they were willing to risk their lives and limbs or whatever it was to make sure that their sons and daughters and children could be educated. So what they did is at the end of the night, after they had worked in the fields, um, they would go home, the plantation owners would go to sleep, they then would get up and go out back and dig this big hole in the ground, a really big hole in the ground. And then they would go down to the bottom of the hole with a candlelight and a Bible. And they would cover it up with leaves up top. And they would teach their children how to read from the Bible. And that commitment to education and the role that a church and faith even played then is something that I feel that we still need to have, that persistence, that prowess, that sense of urgency moving forward when it comes to educating our children today. Um, we're losing this battle in public education. We really are. I don't mean to sound gloom, but we are, especially if you live or are intimately involved in these inner city communities. The disparity is huge. And each time we save one or two kids, we find out there's another eight or ten that are coming into ninth grade or tenth grade four or five levels below where they should be. And it's very difficult to get caught up. And I think you guys have heard these stories, but if you're in eighth grade, I mean third grade, and you're not reading at grade level, if you're in third grade not reading at grade level, 80% of those kids never catch up. So your fate is cast in third grade in many instances. And those who are building our prison facilities around the country are building prisons based on the test scores of what happens in third grade. God, in 2007. I mean, the Imus thing is one thing. I get that. I mean, those comments, that's a whole other dynamic. But literally, our children's fate is cast often by the third grade reading levels, and we're building jails and prisons based on that. We've got to do something to turn this darn thing around. And I truly believe that the role of the church, especially in these urban communities, is critical in doing that. Um, in my particular situation in Sacramento, we took over an existing high school that I went to. It was called Sacramento High School. And it was failing uh, where ninth, ninth graders, only 25% of ninth graders were reading at grade level. 
and the state was about to take over this particular high school, and we went in with our charter proposal and said, look, we believe that we can run it better, et cetera. And the local board, school board, allowed us to do that. But prior to that happening, I went to the faith community and said, look, we're going to need all of your support. We're going to need you to help mobilize. We're going to need you to go to board meetings. We're going to need you to send your children to these schools. We're going to need you to mentor. We're going to need you to expand your ministry beyond the walls of the church if we're going to be successful in this particular community. And that church community really stood up. Um, our model, we focus in two square miles in Sacramento. So is it Dor Dorchester, Roxbury, those communities out here? The community I'm from is very similar to that. But we focus on two square miles, not the whole, you know, Sacramento area. We really focus in terms of what we do. And in those two square miles, there's 40 churches. So 40 churches in two square miles. I mean, that's, well, you know, within every other block. And we had to find a way to bring these churches together. And we wanted to do it around education. And so far, it's been happening in a very impressive way um, in our Sacramento area. The other thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of our model that I think would be interesting is, before I kind of wrap up on the education piece, is when I say economic development, and that's what Harvard Summer Leadership Institute helped me realize, is that you have to find a way to create an economy in your community that does not just rely on government subsidy alone. You're not free. You're not liberated if you can't find other means to stimulate your economy, whether it be private investment or otherwise. It cannot just be government subsidy and funding. And that's one of the things that I was able to understand um, at Harvard. And we went back, and we had already started this, but we took a, a development company, like a real estate development company, and we started developing projects in the community. And those profits from these projects, the developer's fee and your rate of return and all those things that are good in terms of when you're in your black, of things working out well, they go back to fund other projects in your community, which has been very significant. So to date, we have uh, started 14 businesses, 282 jobs, $11 million in, in development, development on one main strip in one community. And Dr. Williams talked about we have a hard, uh, Starbucks in our community. So I think you know the moment you get a Starbucks in your community, you are no longer a distressed community. You, you instantly become a community in transition. So Oak Park is now a community in transition because of, because of Starbucks. And a part of our belief was that if our kids go to school on this campus, what do they do when they leave campus? And we, have to ha we had to look at our, as our community as an expanded classroom for kids. So when they leave our community, our, class, our Sakai campus, they can go get jobs at Starbucks, the bookstore, there's an art gallery. There's tons of places in their community that they can now do things that are not just limited to their campus when they go to high school. The other thing that I want to share in terms of our model ed from an education standpoint is our most ambitious efforts were our charter school initiative. In our elementary school, PS7 is the highest performing elementary school in the area and we've been operating it for four years. And when I talk about the achievement gap, at PS7, our minority students are outperforming the rest of the school. So at our elementary school, there is no achievement gap. It can be done. And there's no magic bullet to what we're doing at our elementary school. Our kids go to school longer periods of the day. Their parents are involved. We have a 95% parent participation rate in everything we do. It's not magic. Our kids go to school from 7.30 to 4.30. They put in a longer day. So at the end of the year, they put in 16,000 more instructional minutes than the other kids in their neighborhood. No magic. Just hard work and sensible and committed people trying to do things that are very significant. So that's at PS7, our elementary school. Our high school is a little bit different. It's a little bit more challenging because you get kids in ninth, 10th, 11th grade, they're behind a few grade levels. It's very difficult to get them caught up in a short period of time, meaning two or three years. So what we elected to do was take on a little different tack. We decided to focus really on college acceptance and admissions for our high school students. That was our tack, which was a little bit different. So typical education reform, when you look at high school, they start with fifth grade, and then they do fifth, and then that fifth grade class becomes sixth, and sixth becomes seventh. And it takes eight years to really get 50 kids to go to college, and very successful. 
What we did was we have 1,200 kids, 300 right now in high school that are 12th grade, 11th, and 10th. Can we get that college going rate up? And before we took over the high school, only 20% of our students were going to four-year college. Only 20% of kids were going to four-year colleges. After four years and these seniors here and their graduating class, 80% of those students are accepted to a four-year college in just four years. 80% of our graduating class are being accepted to four-year, not two years, four years. So when you think about it, it takes some of our educational counterparts eight years to get 50 students into four-year colleges. In the four years that we've been operating our schools, we've had 400 young people be accepted to colleges around the country. And when I say colleges, they're getting into the top UCs, UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC Merced. Charnay, raise your hand. She's going to St. Mary's, a private school, UC Davis. Raise your hand proud, man. UC Davis, San Francisco State, UC Merced. Our kids have gotten into Stanford, West Point, I mean, all kind of top colleges. So th this is something that we're very proud of um, in terms of the work we're doing. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, we have a long way to go to be able to have the impact that we want to have around the country. But I think we're on track to, to closing the achievement gap. And part of that is looking at the work we're doing involving the faith community um, in a real way. Um, the last thing I wanted to just say in, in my comments before we open it up to quick questions are the role that faith can play in mobilizing and inspiring a community is critical. And since we're in Boston, again, I'll just tell a simple Boston story. Um, in 1993, 1994, uh, we were playing, again, the Boston Celtics, and Senator Kennedy uh, was in charge of education and played a critical role. And every city I went to... Um, I would try to meet somebody in that particular city just to, I don't know, broaden my horizon. So I was able to meet with Senator Kennedy. And I asked Senator Kennedy what his thoughts and take was on charter schools. And he really didn't know a whole lot about charter schools. And I remember leaving that meeting going, this is our Democratic leader in charge of education. We know our public schools aren't doing well. He has such influence around our country and didn't have a solution to how we're going to improve public education, one that I at least felt good about when I left. That was very difficult for me. You know, I walked away going, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. And I'm, a, again, a big fan of the senator. But he just really did not, at this particular time, really support charter schools or know a whole lot about it. And as a Democrat, you know, all my eggs have been basically in that basket. But I was thinking, if I'm a parent in a community, what does this mean to me? A couple, a couple uh, years later, we were playing against uh, the Washington, I don't know if they were the Washington Bullets at the time or the Wizards, probably the Bullets, the team in D.C. <laughs> and uh, Clarence Thomas had just recently been appointed to the Supreme Court. And I asked him the same question that I asked Senator Kennedy, and um, Clarence Thomas got you know, very serious. And he said, let me just say this to you. He's got this deep, raspy voice. If I, had a four, if I was a single parent, and I had a fourth grade student, and she wasn't getting a good quality education, I would support anything in the world that would get my daughter a great education. So yes, I'm for charter schools because something out there is broke, and we need to find ways to fix it. And I walked at her going, now I don't have anything in common with this man other than the color of my skin, <laughs> and this is a man that my politics, my beliefs, and my values are in line, and yet... I didn't get what I expected to get in terms of the meeting with both of these folks. So my point of all this is, when we look at education reform, it can't just be about whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It's got to be bipartisan. We've got to put partisanship aside. And it's the same thing with our church community. It can't be depending on what denomination you're in. It's if we have faith and belief and are mission-driven and values and beliefs, that's what's got to unite and bring us all together. And I think the church and the faith community is positioned in a very, very good way to be able to do that in any local community and certainly set the stage nationwide for what I think can really happen in a very positive way um, for educational reform. And my last point in closing in my comment here is I would just like to say that the SHLI and the, the SLI Summer Institute has made a big impact on, on me and many of the other folks that participated in it over the last seven or eight years. 
and we still are in contact with each other. We help each other. We speak. We send donations if we need to. We give internships. We provide mentoring ships. So, Dr. Williams, what you started is has a life of its own, and I, I really hope that the Harvard community here, Dean and others, understand how important it is to the fabric and the mission of Harvard, but also what it does beyond the walls of Cambridge around the rest of the country. So I'm hoping that we can support it and fund it and endow it in a way that uh, gives many, many folks for years to come a very, very positive footing um, for all of us. So those are my brief remarks. I thank you for having me, and I'm open to a couple questions. As, as it's really quite remarkable. I'm I'm very impressed with what you're doing. How do we take? How do you take this microcosm elsewhere? What's your plan to to roll it out? Now, where, can you guys hear me okay? If I'm talking like this. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me on the mic? Can you hear me now? Um, what we have done for 17 years is realize that we have to perfect our model before we can replicate. And what we realize after about 14 or 15 years, we realize we're probably never going to perfect it. We're just going to always continually improve and make it better. So over the last three years, we've been looking at opportunities that we can explore otherwise in other places and communities. So Harlem in New York was a huge opportunity, and I can explain why if anybody wants to know why we're going 3,000 miles away to expand, but right now we're being invited into uh, Indianapolis, New Orleans, Miami, D.C., Phoenix, all kinds of cities. And the good thing about it is we're not going to do anything that we don't think we can succeed with, but what's happening with our funders, especially in the philanthropy world, the big foundations, they want to fund folks that are doing things on a much larger scale, and we are now finally at that position where we can go to scale and expand. Um, so we feel very good. Harlem will be our first kind of test uh, program. We will not bring in our full model. We'll start out with the school piece and then over three or four years phase in the other things that we do, and, and we feel that we'll be very, very successful. Uh, Harvard Business School just wrote a case study um, on our work, and I was there yesterday, and I spoke, and, you know, there were 100 students who just read our case and told us all the reasons why our organization will never succeed for another year. And, <laughs> the audacity of the Harvard students, and then the others who said, you guys are crazy, look at what they've done, and I'm sitting in the back just biting my tongue. For it. So anyway, I got a chance to go out and address the students, so it's been very positive in terms of that. So thank you for that. Yes. Thanks. Kevin, thank you very much. My name is Cornelia Holden, and I'm a 2003 graduate of the Divinity School with a Master's in Divinity. And um, I've taken my Master's in Divinity kind of in an unusual route because I'm now working with athletes. Um, I work with teams. Uh, I've been working with lacrosse teams and also now with the U.S. Women's Ice Hockey Team as the sports psychology consultant. And the reason I, I'm mentioning this is because one of the things I've been interested in working with athletes is eventually uh, you run out of um, physical abilities at some point and you have to make a transition in your life to the rest of your life. And I wondered if, um, I sort of have two questions here. One is if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to talk about how you made that transition. I mean, how did you, was it, did you feel called to do this work? What, what happened? You briefly spoke about coming, you know, you got in here and then to make that choice to go back and play for the Suns a little bit longer. Um, so I'm curious about how you did that and what advice you might have for me, for, for me in particular as I work with these athletes. Um, and uh, I guess that's the second piece of my question is what, what advice you would have. So, so I, I would say, everybody hear me okay? Okay. So I would say that I need to start with my grandfather really quickly, and Dr. Williams talked about him. But my grandfather was a sheet metal worker, so he was very practical. So like everything we did was very practical. He'd say, measure twice and cut once. You measure twice and you can cut once. And you, know, you hear that growing up. And All right, I got it. Measure twice, cut once. Um, so he was very practical. So even my faith. Is very practical. You know, what good is it if you're holy and all riled up Sunday for two hours and doesn't translate into anything the other six, six days of the week? Um, so faith without works, you know, is dead. We all know that. 
So what my grandfather also did was say, you need to have goals and you need to start with the end in mind. And then kind of work backwards. So before I even went in the MBA, he had me preparing for getting out of the MBA. I'm like, I ain't even got there yet. He's like, nope, you need to have a plan post MBA. I'm thinking, no, I need to try to make an all-star team and win a championship and get a long contract. He's like, nope, you need to have a plan post MBA. So what I would tell you, the advice would be that simple um, for athletes just in general, whether you're in high school, college, or beyond, is that sports is a great thing, and you want to have it be something you can do your whole life. But in terms of being paid to do it, if you're lucky enough to be the few, it's only going to happen for a few years. So you need to be thinking about who you are as an individual a lot longer than the few years that you're playing sports. Uh, Isaiah Thomas had a quote um, that I read not too long ago. He said that if all that I'm remembered for is the days on the basketball court, then the rest of my life really sucks. So I don't know if I'm supposed to say that here. Anyway, next question. That was Isaiah, not me. Yeah. And whether or not, and I'm asking specifically because in your list of cities, um, in your list of cities, you didn't mention that Boston's invited you, and I'm just wondering why. <laughs> uh, did you ask what was violence like? Was that the first part? So in our community, I'll describe it. We have 28,000 folks. Crime rate is very high. Unemployment is high. Home ownership is low. All the stuff that happens everywhere. So it's very similar in terms of that. So I'll, I'll talk about the high school really quickly. The high school in, is the second oldest high school west, is, west of the Mississippi. So we're celebrating a 150-year anniversary right now. I was driving over here, and I saw 250 or 225. Like two, I thought we were like the old 220. Y'all folks been around a long time at Harvard. Um, but in terms of being the second oldest high school west of Mississippi, in the 60s and 70s, when all the race issues were going on, the high school just plummeted. So for 40 years, it had not been doing well, and crime and violence were very high, not just the high school, but the community. So the moment we took over the high school, and our kids wear uniforms to school, and every student who goes to our school has to want to go to a four-year college. If they don't want to go that, they need to go to another school. The moment you start creating those expectations, what happens is your high school culture changes. We don't even have fights very often on our campus, and that's almost not abnormal. It's like you almost need to have a fight every now and then just to make sure kids are normal. Um, so it's went down so much at our high school. Well, that starts to carry out in their community. So when they walk home, they're in uniform. And, kid, and people in the community are like, oh, those are private school kids. Well, no, they don't pay t tuition, but they want to go to college, and they want all the benefits of a private school, smaller classes, rigor, and all those things. So it has carried over and spilled out into our community in a very positive way. We're the only high school in Sacramento that does not have a police officer on campus, and we're in the middle of a urban hood, so to speak, that we're just basically violating everyone's expectations in terms of the work we're doing. Yes, sir. Kevin, uh, it's obvious you can't cover all of the needs and the opportunities around the country. Around the country, around the world, but by chance, have you written anything up which we could take back to our communities or that you could share with other communities around the country? So, the, you know, I get the importance of documentation. I get the importance of chronology, you know, doing a chronology of the work you do and studying it, and that's why I was so excited. Harvard Divinity School did a first case study on leadership and organization. The business school just did one on our organization in general. And right now, you know, people have approached us in terms of books and all that, and we said no, 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 no. So we do not have a defining document that I could send to you, but I could send you whether it be our collateral materials that are helpful to talk about our model, or I can send you a case study or things like that that other communities can look at and study. Uh, maybe one day uh, Dr. Williams will say, hey, we've raised X amount of dollars and somebody's going to write something on, on what you're doing. We're just not there yet. We're probably on the brink of that. Yeah. Two more questions and then we'll let you catch your travels. Dr. Adams, stand up real quick. We've got to get this man a round of applause here. <laughs> I don't know if y'all have ever heard him preach, but whew, and he can do it in a whole bunch of languages, too. <laughs> Any final question or two? Yes, sir. And then you guys, who's going to come up, Charnay or somebody? Yes. Charter schools have not gotten very good press recently. And there's been a 
lot of disappointment even among people who have supported them. And I wonder if you could comment on that because obviously you're a, a real believer and you've had a great experience. So I would probably challenge the question a little bit. Charter schools have not got positive press in some areas. Every state looks at charter schools differently. Every community looks at charter schools differently. Every school district looks at charter schools differently. So there's plenty of studies coming out, and probably three out of four saying that charter schools are outperforming similar target populations. And, you know, that's happening. The charter school movement's not going anywhere. But I will tell you this, to your point, the moment one charter school doesn't do well, those critics are like, oh, charter schools, throw them out. Get rid of them. So we have to really have a very high standard of accountability. And we have to not only do equal and better than our counterparts, we have to do even better than that. So I would say that there are going to always be critics. That's what makes America good in terms of what we do. But I do think, it, it, at, by and large, charter schools are doing very, very well. And some states look on them a lot more favorably than others. For instance, California um, is favorable on charters. But our city, our local school district, politics, the teachers union, has control, that special interest group. And they do not look at charter schools favorably. That's why we couldn't grow in Sacramento in the immediate area. But to go to Harlem where you have a mayor and a chancellor and a superintendent and everybody who's really excited about this, the environment is much more conducive for us to being successful there. Yes, last two. And can you Kevin, I'd be interested. You, you talk about we, which implies that there's a team here. And could you just share a little bit about this team of people that you work with and how you came to put them together, who, who they are and, and how they have come to be your team? So I think it, it's mission driven. And here's what I mean by that. The YMCA should be part of our team, whether we've done things together or not, because their mission and what they do in local communities. The same for Boys and Girls Club, the same for churches. So our goal is to make as many connectors as we can possibly make. So our team, we have almost 150 employees who work for us. And we do have probably four or five folks who've graduated from Harvard, business school, school of ed, and Kennedy School of Government and all that. But we have 100 teachers in Sacramento. So all those are our immediate team members. But how we leverage and forge partnerships with other folks that are mission driven, maybe doing something a little different than we're doing, and bringing those collaborations together and come to fruition, I think is where it becomes very powerful. So when I say we, it's, it really boils down to this mission for me. Anybody who wants to be a part of eradicating the inequalities in public education, that's a we for me. Because we've got to find a way to get rid of that inequality in our country. All right, last question, and then please ask the students one question so you can see why we do what we do. Uh, I actually have a question for Perfect. the students. It sounds like you guys might really stand out in your community, you know, walking away from school with your uniforms on and just being so successful. And I wonder how you guys navigate that, whether it, it seems to be threatening to the people around you or, and if you're able to move past that to be a positive influence on others. Um, my name is Sharnae James, and I'm a senior. And the point of wearing uniforms it's to be recognized by our community so everyone recognizes us as a Sacramento High School student and they know the benefit that we're doing for the community as a whole. So everyone's jumping on board with what we're doing at our school. So it's not like we're going through our community and we're a threat to them. They actually are welcoming our presence. And the uniform is such a symbol of positive change that is going on. So everyone's welcoming it and it's actually doing good for the other people who don't go to our school, like the um, community dwellers, the people who live there, the residents. So it's actually benefiting everyone as a whole. Yeah. All right, we need a question for the students now. You got to put them on the spot. I told them this is what life is about. Come on, Harvard, tough question. They get a chance to go home and tell their students. They were in Harvard ask, answering questions. Yes. I have the uh, I have the benefit of having actually visited uh, Sacramento, Oak Park, and uh, your high school. And I would like to hear from each of you which high school program you're enrolled in, why you chose it, and what you think you're going to do after you finish college. Um, my name is Angel Rojas, and I'm a senior in MEHS, Math and Junior Health Sciences. And I chose that one because I plan on being a doctor, 
And as of now, I've finished all my required courses because of our 4x4 four four schedule. So um, actually all I'm doing now is interning, which is possible through my small school. And uh, all I do is I'm, I'm at a clinic every day. And for example, just two days ago, before we came here, I learned how to give injections, which I'll be giving my first one next week. <laughs> so it's just, the reason I chose it was because of the uh, partnership we have with UC Davis. So, and I'll actually be attending UC Davis. So that's why I chose it. Uh, my name is Walter Jones. I'm a senior, business and communications. And I chose that school because I want to be, I want to be a music producer and go to college and major in music management and music production. And since I'm going to San Francisco State next year, I'm going to have an internship with my cousin who owns a record label so I can get an early start for the future when I want to get my own. Um, my name is Shonae James again, and I'm in business communications. And um, I was battling with going to School of Arts because I like to draw and I like art. So I chose business communications because I want to double major in English and communications and minor in art at St. Mary's. And um, I interned my junior year during the summer at a clear channel radio station, a local radio station, and I was with the promotions company. So I learned how to promote a radio station, and I did radio classes my freshman and sophomore year, how to be a radio manager. So that was helpful going into the business world. And I'm having an art show come up this weekend, Saturday, at the um, 40 Acres Art Gallery. And it's the best at high. It's a really renowned show for student work, and I'm really excited and um, sell some artwork and buy some art supplies. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, my name is Elizabeth Perkins, and I'm a senior in the small school of uh, law and public service. And I chose a small school because I have a real passion for law. Um, I, w I like justice, and I feel that there's a lot of inequality in the justice system as of now and in past cases. So I feel that because I'm in this small school, I have a, a better chance in college as well as in graduate school, law school, to succeed in my law career. Um, we have a, um, a program with uh, McGeorge Law School. So we have a couple. One's a mentorship, and the other one is um, a street law class. And this class basically um, covers civil law, um, certain, certain um, torts, criminal law. And uh, we're having a mock trial that's coming up on Sunday, this Sunday. And that's going to be at McGeorge Law School. So that's very exciting, and I've been taking classes uh, every Thursday at um, the law school, and it's a civil procedure, so I'm getting rules and how to kind of start, you know, trying cases, basically. So I feel that law and public service is the best choice for me, and I feel that I'm getting the best education in that small school for what I want to do. Thank you very much. So this is why we do what we do. Thank you for inviting us to Harvard. We appreciate you very much. Thank you. And I have now the sad and happy duty of uh, bringing uh, our time together to an end uh, for this, uh, this meeting of the council. Um, I have some thanks, though, that I would like to make first. Uh, if you will uh, hold with me for a moment, I really want to recognize in particular the staff here uh, that have done such a, I don't know, really way above uh, the normal expectations level of work to make this happen in such a tight amount of time through so many different venues. You have no idea how, I mean, I it was over trying to, to think about what I was going to say last night at one point, and uh, the staff was already at, uh, at 4.30 uh, swarming over the Charles Hotel uh, getting things ready. Uh, anybody that has run any events know that they, they don't happen because of the talking heads at the platform. Uh, we're just kind of trotted out uh, at the end of a long process of hard work. And uh, the staff at the Divinity School, and particularly the staff in Development and External Relations, deserve, I think, a big hand. If you all are here, would stand up. I think most of them are up in the back in various places, but please stand up if you would and let us thank you. Yeah.
I'm used to the quality of their work, but I always am surprised by uh, how well things go when they take hold of it. Uh, and I'd like to thank now all of you um, for joining us uh, for this, uh, really, 24 hours. Um, it seems like it's been a lot longer than that, and, and it's been a happy uh, length, uh, as not all 24-hour uh, events are. Uh, I hope you found the, the meetings together to be as inspiring and uh, I think is enlightening uh, and is moving at many points as I have found them. Um, I find that uh, I've, I've learned a lot myself in the last 24 hours. Uh, we do appreciate your presence, each and every one of you with us, and your willingness to engage with Harvard Divinity School in our efforts to reach out to a wider network of persons in varied walks of life and in different types of responsibility about the important, if often vexed, and often quite mixed roles of religion and life at home and around the globe. I guess what we ask in return, as you might expect, is a twofold commitment of support for our work. First, we hope that you're going to tell your friends, family, colleagues, uh, and anyone else you encounter about our work and our aspirations and about some of the uh, wonderful people uh, who uh, touch uh, the things that we do here and whom we like to hope that we are helping or supporting. As kind of ambassadors for us, you can help us spread uh, the understanding or spread the, at least the knowledge of the, uh, the importance of understanding uh, religion and its role in contemporary affairs and in contemporary issues and let people know a bit more widely about our unique, quite globally, I think, oriented approach as well as quite diverse approach to the conjoined issues of religion in every, uh, uh, in every society, wherever it may be, in this country or abroad, as a social and political reality. And religion is a theological and spiritual concern of hugely varied individuals and groups here at home and abroad. And I mean by that not only varied in terms of which religion a person belongs to, but also varied in terms of what classes of people are engaged in religious practice and involved in religious concern. Also, what ethnic groups uh, are involved. The kinds of things that we're wrestling with now as we try to diversify our student body and our faculty much more radically than has ever been done before. I think it's very important uh, to get this message out there. We also are always looking uh, for new students. I don't think any of your four, Kevin, are headed towards divinity, but maybe they'll come back to one of our other professional schools here. We're pretty eclectic. We encourage any of that. Uh, in any case, we are always looking for wonderful students and for other people who will be interested in what we're doing. And secondly, of course, I do hope that many of you might consider supporting our work with some kind of gift at some point that's appropriate for you to the divinity school or to one of its, uh, one of its important programs. Uh, it is only, I think, with the help of trusted friends and concerned supporters of our work that we can remain at the forefront of religious and theological studies as we aspire to do. We're setting our sights now on new and ambitious goals, and we will need, frankly, all the help we can muster. I do want to thank you for being with us, and I do hope to see all of you again individually in many venues, and I hope in this kind of venue again uh, sometime next year. So thanks again for coming. Please feel free to, uh, to, to stick around and talk a bit if you like, but you also, if you've got to catch that plane uh, or try to get out ahead of the snow, uh, I'll understand that too. So thank you again for coming.